seat. If you don't know me yet, my name is Mitch. I'm, uh, I'm one of the pastors here. And um, last week, I had to I had to call uh, an audible, which thankfully Pastor Pat was already slated to preach, but I got I got really sick again and wasn't able to make it. Um, but in the midst of all of that, I I'd been reading in Kings in my in my personal time in my Bible time. I'd been reading in Kings, and I could not get away from this passage. And if you know me, I'm a planner. I plan these things out, and um, it seemed like all week. I just, I kept coming back to this passage, and I'm like, God, I already have a sermon written for this week. I already have the slides done. I really got, I've, I've got it done, and God just kept bringing me back to this passage, and I just kept arguing with him. You ever done that? To argue with God? Listen, he wins, so uh, ultimately I, I give in, but, you know, I kept arguing. I'm like, God, I'm pretty sure this is just COVID brain. I don't know like everything's foggy. I don't. I don't understand. Like why? Why you want me to preach this passage? It's kind of obscure. Um, you'll see that here in just a minute. It's it's kind of a weird passage. But God just kept me bringing back to this. So so we listened. We we called an audible earlier this week. Gabby changed the set. We changed the the slides. But um, we we altered stuff. And so is that okay if we just kind of preach what God has laid on my heart this week that, that we can, we can uh, dive into some other stuff next week. But um, what, I, what I love about the, this church is that we just, we have some uh, people from different faith backgrounds, right? We have people who grew up in church. We have people uh, like me. I didn't, I didn't start going to church until I was about in high school. And we have some people who came to faith later in life and this whole church thing is new to them, but we have some people who have who've questioned the faith. We have some people who are debating leaving the faith. We have some people who are new in the faith. We had a couple get baptized just last week, right? Uh, so, so really, really good stuff that that has happened. But um, for for most of us, I think that there there'll be some point in our life if you haven't hit this yet, some point in your life where where you'll come to the the point where you say, okay, is this is this actually true? Like, okay, God, is this actually real? I maybe grew up in this tradition, or I came to faith at some point, but is this real? And typically, the, those things happen in a, a pivotal circumstance. Something happens in our life, and we say, okay, is this actually real? And if you're like me, in my adult life, that's probably happened like three or four times. Okay, God, are you real? God, are you really there? And, and, and so what I've realized is, is I've grown in my faith, as I've studied more, as I've been discipled in this, is that sometimes God will give you exactly what you ask for. And sometimes he doesn't. Sometimes God will give you exactly what you ask for. And sometimes God will give you what you should have asked for. Anyone ever experienced that where you pray one thing and then God gives you something else and you're a little disappointed? And then you look back later on and you say, okay, God, I see, I see what you're doing in that. I see why uh, you, you broke me up with the girl with the lip ring. I understand why that happened. If you have a lip ring, nothing wrong with that. Just not where God wanted me to go at that point in my life. Uh, a couple of years ago, my parents uh, moved or my mom moved out of the house. And uh, so I was able to see, I don't know if that's ever happened to you, but you're able to kind of see some stuff from your childhood, like the drawings that you drew and you thought that you were a great artist and then you look back at those and you're like, ah, not so much. The report cards, I was able to see the report cards uh, of how just a terrible student I was. And then my sister's here, I was able to see her report cards and she's just the best student. And I remember one was like, hey, why can't you just be more like your sister? And I was like, ah. Uh. Anyway, anyway, sorry, she's here. I had to, had to point that out. But, but I remember, so I, I remember finding a prayer journal, a prayer journal from high school. My youth pastor had taught us to, to pray in this specific way, where you would have a journal and you'd write down on one side your, your prayer or your prayer request. And then as those things are answered, you know, you write down on the other side, right? You'd write down how God answered that prayer. And over time, it was awesome to just see how God answered prayer over time, that, that God consistently answered prayer. And, and most of the prayers were answered. Some were just left blank, blank. And have you ever looked back and just thanked God that he didn't answer some of the prayers that you prayed? 
You ever look back and say, okay, God, I see what you were doing. I'm so thankful that you didn't answer some of those prayers. We, we thank God that God didn't answer some of those prayers, or a lot of us would be married to Christina Aguilera right now, because that was my prayer in high school. Like, God, she's a genie in the bottle, and I, 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 I got to have it. Anyway, so, so as a child, we ask for a lot of different things, but as we get older, we start to ask for some other things. And when you look at Scripture, isn't prayer the thing that differentiates us? Isn't prayer the thing that differentiates us from every other religion in the world? That we have a God that listens to us. That we have a God who listens. And this is the story of Elijah. And what I've realized is that most people who lose their faith end up losing a faith in a God that, that we don't really believe in anyway. They lose their faith in a God that they've made up, a God that they set expectations for. They lose their faith in a God. And, and a lot of times I talk to these people and they're saying, Mitch, I, I've lost faith. God didn't answer my prayers in this way or, or this thing happened in my life and I've lost faith. And my answer is, well, I, I don't have faith in that God either. That uh, we, we lose faith in a God that we project, a God that, that we make up. Make up. And, and so I want to show you some things in this passage that, that God brought to mind uh, last week and this week that, that he says about himself that are very distinctive. So 1 Kings chapter 17, and we're going to start in verse 1. So if you have a Bible, open up your Bible. If you have the YouVersion Bible app, go ahead and jump in that. And so this is starting the story of Elijah. So Elijah, the Tishbite of Tishbe in Gilead, said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. How would you like that to be your first ministry experience, right? The first thing that God tells you to do is go to this evil king who has all the authority in the world to just chop off your head and say, hey, God's going to bring a drought. Uh, it's not going to rain until the Lord says it's going to rain, and I'm out. And so he leaves, and, and the word of the Lord came to him and said, depart from here and turn eastward and hide yourself by the brook of Cherith which is east of the Jordan, you shall drink from the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. Okay, weird, weird thing, right? So he goes to this evil king, Ahab. Ahab was, was evil. He, there was all these kings in Israel. Ahab married a woman named uh, Jezebel, right? Jezebel worshipped this god Baal. Baal uh, brought the rain. Baal was known as the rainmaker, and so he was the god of rain. He was the god of fertility, and so the first thing that Elijah does is he comes in and says, okay, there's going to be no rain in the land. You think that your God is the rainmaker. My God is the rainmaker. There's going to be no rain in the land. And so, so uh, Elijah comes, gives this, and, and so then God announces there's no rain, not even a dew in the land. Not even a dew in the land. Then God sends him to a brook to be nursed by a bird. Uh, so uh, crazy story. What I want to point out, first thing that, that uh, was revealed to me this week is that God provides through creation. Is that God provides through creation. God is the God of the rain. That God is the God of the birds. That when God wants it to rain, it rains. When God wants birds to feed you, birds will feed you. That God is... Uh, is uh, the God of provision through creation. And so the question that I have is, who or what are you dependent on for your provision? So many of us, we're dependent, and if I'm honest, right, uh, as an uh, American working, right, I would say I'm, I'm dependent on myself, that I can feed myself. I don't need rain, I don't need birds. Birds are spies anyway, right? Like, I don't need those things. I, I just, I can provide for myself. Who are you dependent on for these things? Psychologist uh, Jillian, um, Jillian Rotter developed the concept of the locus of control in the 1950s. And this concept has been used over and over to help people who are struggling with PTSD or OCD or, or all sorts of things. And the 
the, the philosophy or the locus of control basically says this, that a person either has an internal, right, an internal or external locus of control. An internal is that, hey, I can control all things in my life. I can control all the things around me, that I'm ultimately in control of my life. So when, when something happens, when something bad happens, it's ultimately up to me. I could have changed this thing. I could have done this thing. I could have done something different, and then the bad thing would have, wouldn't have happened. Anyone think like that? That's me, right? Like, ah, it's, I, that's what I talk to my therapist about every other week. Like, ah, I could have done, the, I could have done this different. And some people have an external locus of control where, where they would say, well, ev- everything else is at fault. Everything else is conspiring against me or for me, right? Everything else. So they have an external locus of control. And, and, and so when something goes wrong, it's, it's my fault. Or when something goes wrong, it's everyone else's fault. And the reality that we see in this passage is that while we may have a free will, we have a sovereign God who is in control, that he will send the rain when he wants to send the rain, that he will send the birds when he wants to send the birds. He stops the rain for years, and he feeds Elijah by a brook from a bird. The, the God is in control, and, and all of creation, his creation, all of it was designed, it was created to give him glory. It all listens to him. It all obeys him. It, it all is for his purpose. And so who are you dependent on for your provision? Who are you dependent on for your fulfillment, for your clarity, for your purpose, for your food on the table? What God has for you is more than enough. What God has for you is more than enough. Let's keep going. First Kings 17, 5 through 7. Here, we'll keep going here. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, and he went and lived by the book of Cherith, that is east of the Jordan. And the ravens brought him bread. Uh, the, the word there, bread, just means food. They brought him food and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening, and he drank from the brook. And after a while, the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. I love what Elijah does, right? He does what God tells him to do. He goes by the brook. He drinks from the brook. The ravens come. They bring him beef jerky in the morning, beef jerky in the evening. He's able to eat. He's sustained right there by the brook. And what what I found interesting in the story, what I found convicting in the story, is that God, that Elijah did exactly what God wanted him to do. And what happened? The brook dried up. The brook dried up. Anyone ever been in that position where you feel like you're doing all the things, you're checking all the boxes, you're going to church, you're you're praying, you're tithing, you're doing all the things, and it's still a little dry? That God doesn't answer the prayer when you pray it? The brook dried up. Check out what it says next. It says, then the word of the Lord came, came to him and said, arise, go to Zarephath which belongs to Sidon, and dwell there. Behold, I have commanded a widow to feed you. And so God nourishes Elijah by the brook and then tells him to go to Zarephath. By the way, Zarephath was about 100 miles away through enemy territory, and this city was in the middle of Baal's, like, a stronghold. So it was in the middle of, it was where Jezebel was from. So he's going, he's going from this nice, comfortable brook where he has the ravens feeding him. And God says, okay, I'm going to dry up the brook and I want you to go through the desert, a hundred miles through enemy territory. Evil King Ahab is after your head. I want you to go there. I want you to go to the king's wife, so the queen, I want you to go to the queen's uh, home city, and I want you to, to go there. That's where I want you to go. And Elijah is like, what the heck are you doing, God? Can, I, can we go back to the birds and the, the nice little brook? Can we go, can we go back there? The, the author of First Kings, and some think it's, it's Jeremiah, doesn't expand here, but I, I think that for many of us, this is where we find ourselves. We find ourselves in, in this season. The provision was, was comforting, right? Everything was good, and then it wasn't. Everything was good, and then it wasn't. I, I, I told you a little bit about that, that prayer journal, right? And looking back at that, that prayer journal, 
it was very clear to me that that God for for so long would answer my prayers almost almost it looked like anything I prayed, right? God, I, I pray for this student to come to faith. The student would come to faith. I pray for this provision that God would provide. I pray for this thing that, that God would provide. That for, for about the first 20 years of my Christian life, that God would provide until he didn't. He provided, he provided, he provided. And then it felt like my prayers were just hitting a ceiling just a few years ago. That anything I prayed would just hit. And every, every single time, it felt like I was just in a consistent battle. It was consistently battling. And I think in that season, as I'm coming out of that season, I, I think what God was telling me is this. Saying, Mitch, you talk a lot. You talk a lot, but you listen very little. You move a lot. You're constantly running. You're doing a lot of good things for me. But, Mitch, I'm going to teach you in this season to rest, and to listen. Yeah, Mitch, I've answered a lot of your prayer requests. A lot of people have come to Jesus. You've done a lot of very cool things. But I want you to listen to me. I want you to listen to me. You're going to take this time to experience the desert before you see what I have for you. Elijah had to experience this valley alone before he could experience the fire on the mountaintop. And what I want you to get from this is that God provides in the desert. That God provides in the desert. I believe that the the biggest reason why people don't see greatness in their life is because they don't have sober judgment about how long the desert will take. They don't have judgment about how long the desert will take. Oh, I started a business, and it's about 18 months in, and it's not yet profitable, not knowing that that it takes about three years for a business to be profitable. Why, I started working out, and I was working out for two weeks, and I didn't see the results, not knowing that normally it takes about six months to see the results, right? Yeah, you're working out, but are you eating well, right? I go work out at the gym, and then I hit the Chick-fil-A and get a milkshake. Like, that. that's not going to work. You, you got to see the provision in the desert. Well, we started a church, right? We started a church and not all the, the seats are full, not knowing that it often takes about five years for a church to be self-sustaining, right? We need to understand the length of the desert. If you don't have a plan for provision in the desert, you're going to quit, you don't have a plan, you're going to quit. So what do I need to know? What do you need to know? Check out what, what God says in Habakkuk chapter 2. He says, for the vision awaits its appointed time. It hastens to the end. It will not lie. If it seems slow, wait for it. It will surely come. It will not delay. Hear me. If it seems slow, If it seems like the provision has not yet come, if it seems like the prayers are hitting the ceiling, wait for it. Wait for it. Our God is not like everyone else. He will not lie. Wait for the provision. What do you do in the season in the desert? What does Habakkuk tell us? He says, write down the vision. What does God have for you? What does God want for you? What promises are good? The desert may seem hot. The desert may seem overwhelming. The birds aren't coming to feed you anymore. There's no brook. You're in the middle of enemy territory. What do you need to do? Write down the vision and wait for it. Our God does not lie. He is right there for you. He will not delay. If it's not good, God's not done. Write down the provision. Cling to it. If it seems slow, wait for it. If it seems slow, wait for it. I read this week of a, a woman named Corey Ten Boom. Anyone heard of Corey Ten Boom? She was a, a watchmaker, uh, a Dutch watchmaker, and uh, one of the, I, I believe, the first woman to ever be a certified watchmaker. Uh, lived in 
uh, lived in, um, I don't remember where she lived, the Netherlands, uh, and, and so lived there, and, uh, and then Nazi, the Nazi Germany began to invade, and she, um, she decided with her family that she was going to hide these Jews in the walls of her house. Eventually, she would end up being arrested. She would end up being sent to a concentration camp. Her father died. Her sister died. Uh, she was in the middle of this. While, but while in the middle of this, uh, many people testify that she led people to Christ over and over and over in the middle of these contra- uh, concentration camps, leads prisoners to Christ uh, with a smuggled-in Bible. Didn't even have the whole thing, just parts of it. And, and, and later writes this. She says, she says, you can never learn that Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. You can never learn that Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. She had a right to be angry for the rest of her life, a right to be upset, a right to be disappointed, a right to just leave God. But she says, no, you'll never learn that Christ is all you need until Christ is all you have. Here's a good question. If God takes it from you tomorrow, are you okay? If God takes it from you tomorrow, are you okay? If not, you've made that thing your idol. What is it in your life that if God took, you would not be okay? For me, be my family, be my little girls. If God took those, we, God and I would have some conversations, right? They're, they're an idol in my, my life, something that I need to work on. So Elijah gets to this point. He's in the desert, right? He's got no food. He's got no job. His pet raven's head fell off, right? Uh, anyone get that joke? Anyone? Okay, okay. Dumb and dumber, please. Okay, so Anna was like, Mitch, don't tell the joke. Nobody's going to get it. Nobody's seen that movie. I was like, honey, people have seen Dumb and Dumber. Pet's heads have fallen off, right? He's in enemy territory, an enemy turf, and this is what, this is what happens. If you think that the ravens bringing him food was weird, here we go. Let's get into the weird. So he arose and went to Zarephath, and he came to the city of the gate. And behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. That's what people do. And he called to her and said, bring me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. And as she was going to bring it, he called to her and said, bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. And she said, as the Lord your God lives, I have nothing baked, only a handful of flour in a jar and a little oil in a jug. And now I am gathering a couple of sticks that I may go and prepare it for myself and my son, that we may eat it and die. And Elijah said to her, do not fear. (laughs) And as you do, uh, as you, sorry, do not fear. And as you do as, uh, do as you've said, but, but, but first make me a little cake and bring it with me. And afterward, make something for yourself and your son. Now, okay, is Elijah a jerk or is something else going on here? Do you get the picture? A widow comes. She's gathering sticks. She's about to make her last meal for her son. And Elijah's like, hey, bring me water. She says, okay, I'll bring you water. And then he says, ah, so bring me a cake as well. And she's like, well, I'm, I don't have anything to make you a cake. I'm about to drink, eat this last meal, and then we're going to die. He's like, okay, do as you said, but first bring me, bring me a cake. Uh, it's so, I don't know. I think it's hilarious. But uh, so, so then uh, do this for your son. For thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, um, the, the jar of flour shall not be spent and the jug shall not be empty until the day that the Lord sends rain on the earth. And she went and did as Elijah said, and she and he and her household ate for many days. The jar of flour was not spent, neither did the jug of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke by Elijah. Here's what I want you to get, is that God's provision is unlimited. While it may seem like, we may feel like, it's limited, right? I only have a little bit of flour, I have this little bit of oil, I'm going to make this cake and I'm going to die. While it may feel like that, God's provision is unlimited. God's provision is unlimited. I want to ask you, how many jars are you putting before God? 
Do you see what she does there? The, that the jars will never be empty, that there's an unlimited amount there available, unlimited amount of flour, unlimited amount of oil. The, the, in the ancient world, that was the, the life-bringing source. The, that was all they needed for life. If you had oil and you had flour, that you had life. And I think for us, for so many of us, we bring to God little jars. And he says, I have an unlimited amount available to you. So many times we pray for so little. We pray for so little. We pray for little things. We have little requests, tiny little requests before God. What would happen in your life if you brought him a big jar that he could provide for you all that you want? all that you want. I want to ask you this question. If God answered every prayer of yours, every single pray, prayer that you prayed this week with a yes, what would be different in the world? Every single prayer that you prayed, he answered with a yes. Maybe you won the Powerball, right? Maybe, maybe you did something that, that maybe, maybe something happened. Maybe your kid would stop picking his nose or, or maybe like the person at the red light moved. But what would be different in the world? How would the world look different? Let me ask you this gut check question. How many unsaved people are on your prayer list that you pray for daily? How many of them would be in the kingdom if God answered every single prayer? How many would be in the kingdom today? How many unbelievers are you engaged with? Do you have their numbers in your phone that you could text them and have coffee with them this week? What if God said yes to every single prayer that we prayed? Because God's provision is unlimited. His provision is unlimited. It is us who put the limits on God. But we pray for too little. God wants to hear our big prayer requests, our big vision, our big dreams. A little insight here. This woman came to know God because a weirdo entered her life. Elijah just showed up and started asking some pretty weird questions and did some pretty weird things. Center Church, this is my challenge for you. Be a little weird. Be a little weird. Most of us came to faith because a weirdo invited us to church. And it was different, right? Let me tell you about my first experience going to church. My first experience going to church. I was invited to church. My grandpa was a pastor. We went to his church. But that was kind of a, that was a different thing. The first time I actually decided to go to church, it was because a, a, couple, a couple that uh, my parents babysat their kids. And these kids were the weirdest kids. One of them ate my, my pet goldfish. And so these kids were already weird. We didn't have a great relationship. They invited me to go to church. And so I, I don't know. I had nothing to do on Sunday. So we went to church. I remember sitting there in a pew similar to this and pull out a hymnal. Everyone, anyone ever try to read a hymnal without knowing what it, I don't know what that was. Like, I was like, is this tongues? Like, what is this? And it, it was different. These weirdos invited me, right? And they kept telling me about this Jesus that loves me. And these, the, these people who were different kept inviting me and kept loving me. It was because somebody was a little bit different. Elijah was a little weird, and it changed this woman's life. You have a, a message that people desperately need. Invite them to come with you. Might be a little weird. Might be a little bit different. Just tell them that you're going to coffee and bring them here. And you just say, ah, oh, there's coffee, right? I want to challenge you this coming Christmas. Invite somebody to come with you to Christmas Eve. Invite somebody to come with you to Christmas Eve because they're going to hear the gospel. They're going to hear about Jesus. Not because you need to bring people to hear from me because I have this, this magical message that they can hear, but because it can be a conversation starter that you can then talk about later. It can, this, this message on Christmas Eve is going to be an opportunity for you to lead your friends, your neighbors, your loved ones to Jesus. You have a message that people desperately need, and they need to hear it, and it's an opportunity to share more. And what, what I see in this passage is that God is also the God of the outsider. 
You may say, well, they're, they're a little bit too far gone. All of us were a little bit too far gone. I know you, right? You were way far gone. Some of you are, are the weirdo, right? And it's okay to be the weirdo. Look at, look at this woman. She is outside of the promised land, outside of the promise of God. She was a racial outsider. She was a Gentile. She was a religious outsider, a pagan, a gender outsider. She was a woman and an economic outsider, right? She was a widow. She was a poor widow. The first sermon that Jesus preached, did you know the first sermon that Jesus, Jesus preached was a, on this passage? The first sermon that Jesus preached was on this passage, Luke 4, 25 through 26. But he says, in truth, I tell you, there are many widows in Israel in the days of Elijah, that there are a bunch of widows when the heavens were shut up for three years and six months and the, and the great famine came over all the land and Elijah was sent to none of them but only to, only to Zarephath in the land of Sidon to a woman who was a widow. Jesus' whole message here, his first message, is that Jesus came for the outsider. That I came for the outsider. I came for the one who might seem too far gone. For the gender outsider, for the poor outsider, for the racial outsider. He came for the outsider. That God is the God of the outsider. And, and so Jesus preaches this message that God is the God of the outsider, that all are welcome in his kingdom. And what did they do? They, they threw a huge party, right? They, they, th they threw the parade like, yeah, God's kingdom has come to earth. No, they took him to the top of a mountain and they tried to throw him off of a cliff. You know what happened the first time I preached my first message? First time I ever preached a message, I was 17 years old in an old Baptist church, and the youth pastor took me out for ice cream after when everyone came up and told me how proud they were of me. You know what happened after Jesus' first message? They took him up a mountain, and they tried to throw him off of it. And he, it, it's a really cool story, Luke chapter 4. He, he then uh, escapes their grasp and, and then continues this message. God celebrates these people. Jesus' genealogy is filled with broken people. Rahab, a prostitute, and a Gentile that's, that God saved from Jericho. Ruth, uh, a Moabite. Bathsheba, uh, uh, who committed adultery with David. But all these women repented, and God used them. In Jesus' genealogy, Father Abraham is mentioned in the same list as the prostitute Rahab, because in Jesus... The prostitute and the king sit down at the same table, that they're equals, that we're not better than anyone, that all of us need the redeeming message of Jesus. Let's keep going. So, so 1 Kings 17, uh, 17, he goes, after this, the, the son of the woman, the, the mistress of the house, became ill, and his illness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. He died. And she, came, and she said to Elijah, what have you against me, O man of God? Have you come to bring my sin to remembrance, underline that, and to cause the death of my son? And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from her arms and carried him up to the upper chamber where he lodged and laid him on his own bed and cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God. Have you brought calamity even upon the widow with whom I sojourned by killing her son? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and cried to the Lord, O Lord, my God, let this child's life come into him again. And the Lord listened to the voice of Elijah, and the life of the child came into him again, and he was revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper chamber into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son lives. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, that the word of the Lord in your mouth is truth. Now there's so much here that I, I don't understand. I don't understand, right? I don't understand why... God let this boy die. I don't understand the language in this. The language in this where, where the woman blames God and then Elijah seems to do the same. God, why did you kill, why did you kill this boy? I don't, I don't understand that. I don't understand why he took the boy up to his bed and laid the boy on the bed. It seems a little weird and then laid his body on the boy. Like, I don't understand that. 
I don't understand it. And let me, let me just point this out, that if, if there are things about God that you don't understand, that is a good thing. If, if you fully comprehended God, then he wouldn't really be God. If there are things that you don't understand, that, that's good. Why does Elijah do, do all this? And despite all of the things going on here, I want you to look at verse 22. It says, And the Lord listened. Look, both people are in distress, right? Elijah has no idea what's going on. All the theological training, right? Prophets from the, for the nation of Israel, God's people. He says, I don't know, God, what, what you're doing. Woman who's in distress, like, ah, you bought, brought calamity on me. Like, it, it's terrible. Everyone in distress. And what does it say? It says that the Lord listened. In the middle of all of this, the Lord listened. And this just blows up every theological system that there is. Whether you believe that God causes all of it or that we have complete free will to do whatever we want, the reality is that God listens, that the Lord listens to all of it. This is a really unique thing that's happening here. It's called a chiasm. I won't explain all of it, but but a chiasm is basically like the the, the verse or the passage mirrors each other. So, so it will say like one, you know, I did this thing and then I did this thing down here. It all, all leads to one central point. The one central point in this passage is that he cries to the Lord. He cries to the Lord. He says, he cried to the Lord, oh my God, let the boy live. That, that the point of the passage, the whole point of the passage is that we can intercede with God. That prayer is intercession, that we can plead, that we can make our requests known to him, and that he will answer. So many times, I was taught to pray, okay, God, if it's in your will, would you do it? God, if it's in your will, would you do it? This passage says, no, no, we can let our requests be known to God, that we can bring to God whatever we want to bring, That, that when we that when we really lay ourselves down, we plead before God that, that there might be times where this is not theological language, where God will change his mind, where God will act on our behalf, that God will do something. And all of this, by the way, all of this is in the context of Elijah's relationship with God. What does he say? Oh, Lord, my God, would you do this? Oh, Lord, my God, all of it is in the context of what we talked about a couple of weeks ago, of the witness that we are with Jesus. All of that is in that context. And by the way, we have a, a group of people here who uh, consistently want to be interceding for you. So we have a, a text chain. We have a prayer text chain. So if you text the word prayer to the number that we have, and it's not on the screen right now, but it will be on the screen later. If you text prayer to that number, that, that will be sent to a, a prayer group that is consistently praying. We have a Facebook group that Gavi created that you can put your prayer request on there, and there are groups of people. Our church will intercede for you. And so I just want to, as, as we close here, I just want to ask you this question. Is it, can, can your God really do anything? Do you believe that? That your God can really do anything? Can your God really carry you like he did in this passage? Can your God really carry you beyond the grave? God here is showing something to Elijah and to Israel that he has the power to do something no other God can do. Baal can't do this. Baal never raised anyone from the dead. No other God raised anyone from the dead. Every other religious system, their God, their prophet is in the ground. Christianity is the only religion, is the only faith in the world where our God is not dead. We proclaim that he lives forever. Don't miss this. The account begins with this question. The woman says, what have you against me, O man of God? Have you come to bring my sin to remembrance and to cause the death of my son? Basically, what she's saying, it's a heartbreaking question. Is that, did my sin do this? Did my sin do this? Think, think of this woman's journey, right? Elijah shows up and she's starving. 
And rather than meeting her need immediately, he asks for something. Then after the whole deal is over, she's learned the lesson and she, she trusts God and then her son dies. We need to realize that, that God has a, a bigger agenda than her felt need. Her greatest need is to know him. Her greatest need is to, to know him. And so many times we just need to look back at life and just see God's, God's provision. I see God's provision all over my life. When I was a 13-year-old kid, I thought that sports was everything. I thought that sports was, was the way. All of a sudden, I started getting popular because I was playing sports, and then, then I tore my ACL, and I, I, could no long, I could no longer play sports. I lost all the friend groups, and that was the thing that drew me to Jesus. God provided. When I was in high school, I could, you could ask my teachers. I could barely read and write, like common sense. Like I could barely do any of that. And now every single week I write a four page essay that I get to deliver to you every week. I remember when I was in high school, we would take shopping carts and we would push them down alleys and go as fast as we could. And there, you know, there would be cross streets that we would just like wing it across these cross streets, just sitting in these these shopping carts flying down and God, God provided. I remember going to friends' houses during lunch and these friends would be doing drugs and drinking, but there, that was never, never even a thought that I would participate in that, that God provided in those things. I got my junior year, I got expelled from my high school for doing something stupid, like just incredibly stupid. Got, got expelled, was able to come back the next year that, that they reinstated me the next year, and it sent a shock to my system to really get my life together, that God provided through all of that. God provides over and over, and sometimes you just have to remember the vision that he has, the provision that he provides. God provides over and over, and God will use the whole narrative of your life to shape and prepare you for what's to come. And so I want to close with this. If it seems slow, Wait for it. Some of you, you're like this woman, and God has been speaking to you, inviting you to follow him, inviting you to slow down, inviting you to trust deeper, inviting you to write down the vision, inviting you to wait for it. Trust the provider. What, what I saw in this story is that Christianity is not see and believe fully. The woman didn't see everything that God was doing. None of us see everything that that God is doing. I wish that God would just paint a portrait of what he wants me to do in the next five years, and then I can follow that plan step by step. But that's not what he does. But it's see a little, believe, and then I'll show you the rest over eternity. See a little, believe, and he'll keep showing you things as you go. Believe, and he'll show you a little bit more. Believe, and he'll show you a little bit more. Believe, and he'll show you a little bit more. Surrendering to the ways of God precedes the provision of God. When you just surrender to his ways, write down the vision, wait for it.